हेलो एंड वेलकम टू बाय जूस एग्जाम प्रेप आई ए एस अ वेरी वेरी वॉम गुड मॉर्निंग टू एवरी वन आई होप ऑल ऑफ आर डूइंग गुड आई वेलकम यू ऑल टू डेज सेश ऑफ द हिंदू न्यूज पेपर एनालिसिस वेर वी विल डिस्कस द मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट न्यूज स्टोरी फ्रॉम द हिंदू न्यूज पेपर फ्रॉम बोथ द मेन्स एंड द प्रिलियम्स एग्जामिनेशन पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू ऑल्सो वंस अगेन रिमाइंडिंग यू इफ यू आर इन द मिडल ऑफ अ यू पी एस की प्रिपरेशन जर्नी और यू आर जस्ट स्टार्टिंग योर प्रिपरेशन एंड यू नीड सम हेल्प इन योर प्रिपरेशन जर्नी यू वॉन्ट टू डॉक्ट टू एन एक्सपर्ट for your help what we have done is we have given a link of a google form in the description of the video fill up that google form and one of our experts will get in touch with you to help you with any issue that you are facing in your preparation these are the topics that we have taken up for today's discussion the first article is about the post office act that was recently passed by the parliament here the author talks about how multiple laws in the past few years have given the power to the government to intercept our communication means many laws have given the power to the government to actually look into and to see what people are talking amongst each other to keep an eye on them second the topic is the second topic for this hindu news paper article is the imec as you know the india middle east europe economic corridor ever since the breakout of the israel hamas war we have seen that the idea of imec has not gone anywhere this was an idea which was the highlight of the g20 summit hosted by india the article talks about what is the future of the imec what can be done what are the alternate routes that can be taken in the future third article is about the growth of india bangladesh ties in the context of sheikh hasina again becoming the prime minister of bangladesh for the fourth consecutive term what the future holds for india bangladesh relationship from the police point of view first article is about the invention of a new ai chip called the kairali ai chip in the digital university of kerala next article the nisar mission which as you know is a joint mission between isro and nasa this is on track to be launched early 2024 that is early this year and the third article from pelims about a fish called mosquito fish what is mosquito fish why is it significant what was the purpose of it and is it turning into a big problem these are topics that we'll be discussing today let's start with the first one the first one is about a recent law passed by the parliament called the post office act now let me first explain the background context of it what is the issue all about and what is the author trying to say nations around the world almost every government wants to know what the people are talking about and there are various ways in which they can do that even if you look at our ancient history the kings and the rulers they used to have spies amongst the common public because the kings always wanted to keep an eye on the ground the kings wanted to know what the common people are talking about that is why they had spies amongst the common public to get them all the information are the people planning something against the rulers should the rulers be worried is there any kind of a coup that is being planned now in the modern era also the governments want to keep an eye on what the people are talking that is why you will see a lot of times the government snoops on your mobile phone there are allegations that the governments read your emails as well if you remember the edward snowden scandal in the us edward snowden who worked for the us government he came out with the information that the american government listens to all the phone calls all the emails of their citizens and of the leaders of other countries as well in that context let's look at what is happening in india in india also there are multiple laws especially the ones that have been passed in the few months as per the author which are giving a lot of power to the government especially to look into the communication that people are having privately in that context first is the post office bill now the post office bill was given the assent of the president of india just a month ago that is december 24 2023 it replaces a very very old law 150 years old law called the post office act of 1898 now what is this law all about although it has a lot of different provision i'll talk about that the most important provision here of this law as per the author is it allows the government to read whatever message or letter you are sending through the post office means it allows the interception of any item by the post office authorities including the conditions of interception such as if there is emergency but this emergency word has not been defined now this is a problem just imagine when our freedom fighters are fighting against the british they used to communicate in terms of letters now imagine if someone is sending a letter to another person writing something about 
against the government and that letter is opened by the government just imagine what will be the fate of that person this is a problem here as per the author the government has taken upon itself the power to intercept any communication that is being done through post office number one second although there are certain conditions under which it can be done like it can be done in case of emergency but there is no proper definition what will be an emergency condition when is it allowed when is it not allowed also the other problem as per the author is if a officer in the post office misuses this power of intercepting these messages there is no liability against that person there is no liability for the misuse of power as well now the interesting part is the post office act is not the only act that allows the government to do this because imagine this in real life how many of you today send a letter through post office if you want to communicate when was the last time or ever have you even gone to a post office if you have been to a post office have you tried to write a letter and send it through a post office most of you in your generation would not have done that so yes the government has introduced a law for post office but the government knows that if they really want to know the real information they have to pass similar acts in other areas as well this is what the government has done so post office act allows a government to read your letters then there is something called a telecommunication bill which again received the president assent on the same day very similar law what it does is it allows the government to listen to telecommunication as well means the messages that you are sending even that can be read and intercepted by the government that is a part of telecommunication bill so government covered number 1 your letter that you send from post offices number 2 they covered any messages that you are sending number 3 the government is also trying to cover whatever you write on social media and let's say you texted someone on facebook you texted someone on one of the apps the government wants to read that as well so that is allowed under the it act of 2000 under the it act of 2000 any information that you are sh sh uh, sharing through a computer source can be intercepted by the government and for this the government does not even require any public emergency this is a problem the post office act the telecommunication act and the it act these three allow the government to listen into any kind of communication now the interesting part is earlier and you would have seen this in old movies as well earlier the governments had the power to intercept and tap anyone's phone calls you would have seen this in movies as well the government tapping the phone call of people and then listening into their communication the governments used to do that very very regularly till 1996 it was in 1996 that the supreme court said that you cannot do this randomly why it's a violation of a person's right to privacy the supreme court said if you really want to listen in and tap someone's personal communication it has to be done as per the procedure established by law it cannot be done randomly that put an end to random phone tapping by the government because supreme court said in article 21 right also includes right to privacy and you cannot just listen into what the people are saying the court also said that when the government says that we are doing this for public safety we are doing this in case of public emergency the government should define what these phrases are the government cannot randomly say oh today it's a matter of public safety so we have to listen in today it's a matter of public emergency we have to listen in the government cannot randomly come up with these phrases the government must define what exactly do they mean by this now apart from this there have been other judgments of the supreme court as well like in 2005 the supreme court said that when you send something through a post office it is not a violation of your privacy now again people of your generation would not know this but you would have read the scene in movies or you can ask your parents so there are different ways in which you could have sent or you can send a letter through post office one is you write a normal letter you write it on a piece of paper you put it inside an envelope then you basically close that envelope and give it to post office they will post it so when you write it in a letter and you put it in the envelope it is safe if they open it up you will get to know who receives it they will get to know then there was something called the postcards i am sure none of you would have ever used a real postcard but let me tell you what the postcards are you can ask your parents so postcards basically were open so they were like this size you write here 
here was a stamp and there was the address and you just put this in the post office or that post stamp and from the post letter box the postman will take it and he will deliver so this letter that is postcard was openly visible to anyone for example the postmaster or the postman who is actually delivering your postcard he will be able to see what you have written the supreme court had said that this is not a violation of your right to privacy yes the postcard should not be read but this is the way in which it is delivered you cannot say that it is a violation of your right to privacy now the problem with this is back in the day if you go back 30 40 50 years people were not really concerned about right to privacy please understand how these things work yes right to privacy is important but all these things only take space in your mind when you know that all the other things in your life are sorted for example if you don't have good food to eat if you don't have a house to live if you don't have a job those things will take the priority once those things are settled, then you will think about, oh, do I have right to privacy or not? Because right now, if I tell you that you give me your personal information and I'll give you food in return. If you're hungry, you will ask for food. That is why right to privacy, etc. is a right that has now become much more debatable. It is now much more in the public domain. 30, 40, 50 years back, people did not really talk about right to privacy that much. Now it is a lot more in the news. Now, the laws that the article is talking about, I want to discuss two of them. First, the post office bill. Now, I would like to remind you something. If you all have read, and I'm sure all of you have read Indian Polity, just take your mind back when you read about something called the pocket veto. Let me give this to you as your homework. Tell me in the comment section, which was the first incident of pocket veto being used in India? Which president used it and for what bill? What was the consequence of it? Once you get the answer, you will get to understand why am I asking this question now. But there is a connection. Please do read this. This is your homework. Do tell me in the comment section. And I read all your comments. Do tell me in the comment section. What was the first instance of pocket veto being used in India? Which was a president who used the pocket veto? What was the consequence of it? Do let me know what was the bill for which it was used. Anyways, so this post office bill that has been given the president assent has these important provisions. The first one that, that the author talks about, post officers can intercept any item that you are sending so they can read your information. Post office is exempted from any liability. You cannot file a case against the post office that they had read your information. Removal of offenses and penalties. So you cannot put any penalty on the people working in the post office. Also, there is one other interesting fact that you must remember. In case you have taken a service from the post office and you have not paid for it. Means you owed the post office some money, you did not give it to them. The government will take that money eventually. The government will treat that in the form of land revenue. The government will treat that in the form of land revenue, that your land revenue is pending, means the notices that you will get from the government for not paying up the money will be in the form of you missing out on the land revenue that you owe to the government. It also removes center's exclusivity. This is also extremely important. Please remember this fact. So far, it was compulsory on the government, on the center, that if they had to send any letter they could only send letter by post. If you remember, whenever you fill the form of any government examination, including the UPS or SSC or whatever, and if something has to be sent as a letter to you, your admit card or result card, etc., it was only sent through post office. Because the law said the center government can only send letters through post and nothing else. Now that exclusivity has been removed. Means earlier the government could not take the services of the private sector to send any letters. Now they can. That exclusivity has been removed now. Also, for the first time, private courier services have also been regulated. The regulation for private courier services as well. That did not exist in the earlier law. Also, the other bill that the author talks about is the telecommunication bill. We have discussed about this also in the past. It talks about giving licenses for telecommunication activities. It talks about how the spectrum will be allocated for running telecommunication services in India. 
spectrum will be assigned through auction except for some uses that are important for the nation. For example, for national security and defense, disaster management, weather forecasting, satellite telephones, etc. Then it also talks about satellite internet allotment. As you know, increasingly many companies are opting for this business where they want to give you internet through satellite. I'll uh, give you another homework and I would really want you to learn about this and read about this. You would all know there's a company called Starlink. Starlink is a company that is run by Elon Musk. It's a company that provides internet connection services to satellite. Just read about and try to find out how many satellites they have sent already. Again, just read about how many satellites I've already sent. You will be surprised to know that within a few years of their existence, they have sent the most number of satellites in the world. They have sent more satellites than NASA. They have sent more satellites than any space agency in the world. They are growing at such a fast pace that they have already sent so many satellites and they plan to send so many other satellites also. Do read about that. So again, Starlink or these companies that are working to provide you internet through satellite are the future. It also talks about the right of way. Right of way basically means when you are setting up telecommunication infrastructure, wires or towers, etc., you have the right of way. means you will be given the right to build that infrastructure over public infrastructure or private property as well. So for example, you have a house. Over your house, there is a wire that is being laid, a telecommunication company laying down the wire. You cannot say no because they have been given the right of the way to set up that infrastructure over public or private property. The government has also set up something on Universal Service Obligation Fund so that the government can collect money to set up infrastructure in those areas where the companies would not want to invest money. So companies won't want to invest money where population is low. Andaman, Nicobar, Ladakh, etc. Lakshadweep. The companies think not many people will take our services. So we will not set up a lot of infrastructure here because it would not be very beneficial profit wise. So government has set up this fund also so that they can give money that no set up infrastructure and you do not have to worry about the profit. These are the important uh, provisions of the telecommunication bill. Do remember that. This was our first article. The second article for today is from International Relations, that is of IMEC. Now, you would remember we have had detailed discussion about IMEC multiple times in the past as well. For those who don't know this, this is India, Middle East, Europe Economic Corridor. India, Middle East, Europe Economic Corridor. So, this was an outcome. It was announced officially in the G20 summit held at India. This is an economic corridor consisting of water, rail, road to join India eventually to Europe. For those of you who don't know, let me first show you a photo so that it's clear to you. So look at this. This is how it's supposed to be. So it will start here in India. It will then connect to all these countries. So it will basically go here. That is a UAE. I'll just change the pen color. So it will go here, UAE. Then there is Saudi Arabia. Then there is Jordan. Then blue one is Israel. And then from waterway, it will connect to countries such as Italy. Then there is France. There is Germany. So eventually, the aim is to connect India to Europe. This is called India Middle East Economic Corridor. Now, it's extremely important for India. It will provide an infrastructure boost. But what has happened? Now, the reason why we are talking about this, the reason why it is a lot in the news is, ever since Israel-Gaza conflict or Israel-Hamas conflict has begun, this entire project is in a bit of jeopardy. Because what is happening is countries in the Middle East in this area, they talk mostly about Saudi Arabia. Now, Saudi Arabia and also UAE, although these two have tried to normalize a relationship with Israel in the past few years, but the reality is the relationship with Israel is still not normal. And now with Israel attacking Gaza, killing thousands of people, the relationship between the two sides has deteriorated further. So what is the future of this project? No one knows. Because for this project to go on, these countries, Israel, Saudi Arabia, UAE, all have to be on the same page. This is a problem which India is facing right now. Because we were 
hoping a lot of good things with this project but now this project seems to be in a bit of jeopardy because no one is talking about it because of the situation in this part of the world right now so there are a lot of challenges in this project right now there is no one talking about it ever since the october attack where hamas terrorists attacked israel and then israel has been retaliating when the imec was announced first it was announced that there will be a meeting within 60 days when it was announced in september that there will be a meeting within 60 days and the sides will come up with a lot more details to tell to public but that meeting has not happened from september we have already entered jan 2024 but that meeting has not happened now there are two ways to look at it one way to look at it is many people say the project is dead already second way to look at it is internally the construction is happening for example let me first show you look at this photo so internally this construction within saudi arabia is happening internally within jordan israel the, com the construction is still happening the problem will be when you join this between two countries this is when the problem will start are you able to join this so internally the construction is still going on it's not that the construction is not going on but yes it is when the countries have to come together to actually have a proper synergy that is when the problem will start now this is where another very interesting country should be discussed turkey now turkey is a very very interesting country why if you look at turkey and how it behaves first it's unique in the sense that it's a part of nato so it's in asia but it's still a part of nato even though it's a part of nato it is very close to russia it criticizes us time and time again it in fact was the key player in the black sea uh, in the black sea deal between ukraine and russia they were able to ensure that there are food grain ships that are allowed to pass through the black sea so turkey plays a very important now turkey has been kept out of this project why mainly india obviously does not like turkey turkey has been speaking up against india time and time again but turkey does not like being out of this project so what turkey has done turkey has suggested time and time again that why don't you overlook israel keep israel out of this project and go to the mediterranean sea through us and i'll show you once again what does turkey mean so look at this remember these two okay this photo you understood now look at this photo so this is Turkey, this is Iran, this is Saudi Arabia. So basically, what Turkey is saying is, why don't you have this project from UAE to Saudi Arabia? Don't go this way. Rather, come to the north, come to Iraq, Syria, Turkey, and then enter Mediterranean, and then go to Europe. Are you understanding? This is what Turkey had been suggesting. Rather than going with Jordan, Israel, why do you want to go that way? Come towards the north from Saudi Arabia, include Iraq, Syria, Turkey, and then you can go to the Mediterranean. This is what Turkey has been saying because they have been left out of this IMEC. Their wish has not been fulfilled, but Turkey thinks that this is the opportunity for them because most of the countries in the Middle East right now are not on good terms with Israel. So they would want that this project can actually be a boost that Turkey's economy also requires in the long run. Now, this project itself is important. First, it's important for the Middle Eastern countries as well. How? Please understand the way in which uh, these Middle East countries are seeing their future. Understand the fact, most of their economy is dependent on the export of oil and gas. As the world is trying to move towards cleaner sources of energy, countries will ditch oil and gas. So these countries in Middle East also have to find an alternative. One alternative is hydrogen. A lot of countries are trying to switch towards hydrogen as a fuel. So if they can produce hydrogen with their fossil fuel, which can be done, if they can produce hydrogen with their fossil fuel and that hydrogen can be transported through this corridor, it will be a big boost to their economy. That is, that is why hydrogen is a major component that will decide the success of this project going forward. Secondly, India also, <clears throat> under its national logistic policy, wants to lower the logistic costs that we have. Now, right now, as compared to the world average, our logistic cost, that is cost for transferring stuff from one place to other, is very high. It can be lowered if more, ex if more uh, expansive and much more accurate infrastructure is built. This is why we want the best of the technology to come in. This is where we want containerization. 
Now you would have seen whenever you see a photo of a port, you will see these huge containers under which the stuff is kept for transportation. Now containerization is a practice of making sure that you use containers for your transportation purposes. India wants proper containerization to be allowed in this route so that our movement through the water through these ports can be much 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 cheaper. Right now most of India's logistics 70% of it moves through road only. <clears throat> but the problem is moving logistics through road is more expensive. Ideally we would want to have 30% road 30% rail and the rest should be through water only. Road transportation is faster but it is much more expensive and that is why we would want that the project that is the IMEC should become a success. One other part about what India is worried in the IMEC context is the capacity of the port in Israel. So in case of Israel if you see their port that is the Haifa port which will be used to transport stuff from India till there and then to go to Europe. The problem with the Haifa port is its capacity is not very high. Its capacity is much lower than India's port, the Mudra port and the Jawaharlal Nehru port. Its capacity is much lower than that. In the long run, India and other countries involved in the IMEC would want to increase the capacity of Haifa port as well. But again, for that to happen, we have to ensure that all the countries are at least sitting on the table and deciding and discussing the future of this project. Right now, it does not seem to be happening, unfortunately. Right now, we have a situation where Israel is not really in talking terms with countries such as UAE and Saudi Arabia. For this project to go on, this has to be the first requirement. There are some other challenges with respect to the IMEC. First, the infrastructure development. Again, it requires a huge amount of money to build such projects. Fortunately, we have countries such as the UAE, Saudi Arabia, which are coming and which are trying to give a boost to this project, which are investing a lot of money. But again, it's not easy to spend billions and billions of dollars for such project. It also is a problem to ensure cross-border connectivity because the relationship between the countries that are involved in this project has always been volatile in the past. There are environmental questions being asked, whether it is friendly to the environment or not in the long run. And again, the financing part, who will finance and whether they would be able to get their money worth. <clears throat> this was the second article for the day about the IMEC. Third article, India-Bangladesh relations. Now, if you look at India's neighborhood one by one, you can go clockwise one by one. You can start with Bhutan, Nepal, China, Myanmar, Bangladesh. Then you can come towards more south in Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Maldives also you can include. If you look at all these countries in our neighborhood one by one, the one country with which in the past decade or so at least, we have had considerably robust and good relationship that is Bangladesh. India played a key role in the creation of Bangladesh 1971. But then the relationship between the two sides till 1990s was not that great. Bangladesh was under military rule for a long time. It was an anti-India rule. But ever since Sheikh Hasina has been in power, so Sheikh Hasina has continuously been in power since 2009. <clears throat> ever since she has been in power, the relationship between India and Bangladesh has become better considerably. Now with Sheikh Hasina winning the elections once again, amid a lot of controversy by the way, India again has a reason to be happy about it but to be cautious as well. For those who don't know Bangladesh politics, let me give you a very brief background of it. Bangladesh, like India, has a multi-party system. There are multiple political parties. But they also have two main political parties. One, Awami League. That is in power, that is Sheikh Hasina's party. Other is BNP, Bangladesh Nationalist Party. Now, usually India-Bangladesh relation depends upon which party is in power. BNP is known to be anti-India. Whenever they come to power, they don't really have great relationship with India. Awami League is known to be much more pro-India. So for India's point of view, we would always want Awami League to be in power. Now, Awami League, the way that they are working, there are some question marks raised over it. Please understand this. As per the constitution of Bangladesh, the law was, when elections are being conducted, there will be a caretaker government formed. Caretaker government will be government 
of the ruling party and of the opposition, they will combine to form a government for some weeks when the elections are being done so that elections can happen in a neutral manner. Sheikh Hasina changed that law. She said that no, I will and my government will overlook the election. There is no need to form a caretaker government. Not just this, they arrested a lot of leaders of BNP. BNP's biggest leader Zia Khalida was also arrested on charges. Now BNP boycotted the election. So most of the political parties in the opposition just boycotted the election. So there was no question mark on who will win the election anyway. So Awami League has won the election. There was only 40% voters that came out to vote. It is a fourth state term for Sheikh Hasin. Now, there have been question marks on our victory, not just within Bangladesh, around the world also. America has also spoken up against it. They are saying that it's not properly democratic. But India does not mind this. India was the first country to congratulate Sheikh Hasina on her victory. This also shows how the two sides, India and Bangladesh, have actually come close to each other. Now, as I said, go back in history. The birth of Bangladesh was because of India. There is no exaggeration in saying that. 1971 India-Pakistan war led to the creation of Bangladesh, India fought that war. It meant that the relationship ideally should be great, but it was not that good. Just a few years after their creation, there was a military coup. The military killed the Prime Minister of Bangladesh and the entire family of Prime Minister was killed. His daughter Sheikh Hasina, today's Prime Minister, was not killed because she was not in the country. She was studying outside in Europe. She came back, she joined the politics, she got a lot of support from India. That is why India and Sheikh Hasina's relationship has a soft spot because of the history that India has shared with her father. Now, till 1990s, the two sides did not have great relations. One of the problems that India-Bangladesh relations suffer from is water sharing. There are a lot of rivers that are shared between India and Bangladesh. India being the upper Ripagian state, has the first right to water. Bangladesh has always wanted water sharing treaties because they want at least some assured amount of water to be given to them. India has not been very keen on signing them. Finally, in 1996, when Sheikh Hasina became the Prime Minister for the first time, India signed the in Ganga Water Sharing Agreement. It is during her Prime Ministership only that most of the agreements are signed between the two sides. 2010, she visited India. 2011, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh visited Bangladesh. India announced duty-free access to Bangladesh products as well. Since 2014, relationship has improved even further. There was a land boundary agreement about exchange of enclaves. Areas were exchanged between India and Bangladesh in 2015. There was a constitutional amendment. There were other agreements signed between water sharing such as Kushiara River, etc. So a lot of good has happened. Doesn't mean that everything is resolved. For example, Bangladesh has been asking for Tista River Agreement, but India has not signed it. Tista River, as you know, originates from Sikkim, goes to West Bengal, then Bangladesh. Bangladesh wants a water sharing agreement on that. We have not been able to sign that agreement so far. <clears throat> on economic terms also, the relationship between the two sides has improved drastically. Bilateral trade has reached $18 billion from 2020-21-22. Bangladesh even started using rupee. <clears throat> for their trade, they did not want to be dependent on the US dollar. India is the second biggest trade partner of Bangladesh after China. Bangladesh, till now, is recognized as one of the least developed countries by the WTO. Now, what happens is when you are called a least developed country, you get many advantages. When you sell your products to other countries, they don't put any import taxes, etc. But with the growth that Bangladesh has shown, in 2026, most probably, they will come out of this least developed country group. Then the problem might start because then they would have to look into how they are able to capture the other market. Bangladesh thus is looking to ensure that they get a free trade agreement with India. There are talks for that as well. The two sides also collaborate on multiple groupings. We meet very, very often, SAR, BIMSTEC, etc. I'll remind you about one more thing. In the recent G20 summit, where India was the host, Bangladesh, remember, is not a member of the G20. It's a very small economy. But even then, India invited Bangladesh as a special guest. These are the kind of things that you do to make someone feel special. These are the kind of things that you actually do with your neighbors to let them know, to assure them that, see, we are thinking a lot of good things about you and we want you to be included. There is a very strong surge in regional connectivity as well. 
India has given line of credit worth seven billion dollars for connectivity project for Bangladesh. Recently, railway link was inaugurated. We have talked about that between Akhara and Agartala in Tripura. There are three passenger trains that connect India and Bangladesh right now. Maitri Express, Kolkata and Dhaka, Kolkata Kholna Bandhan Express and New Jalpaiguri and Dhaka Mitali Express. All these connect India and Bangladesh right now. India is also in, as you know, is involved in IMT, India, Myanmar, Thailand highway project. Bangladesh has expressed interest that they also want to be a part of this project going forward. Not just this, India also sells electricity to Bangladesh, about 2000 megawatts of electricity. So a lot of good things have been happening between the two sides. India, Russia together, as you know, have also been building in Bangladesh first nuclear uh, uh, power project that is in Rupur. Also an example of what the two sides have been able to achieve. Having said that, there are some issues that are unresolved right now. Tisa River Agreement, as I said, Bangladesh very desperately wants the Tisa River Agreement to be signed. India has not been able to finalize that due to our internal politics. There is a Rohingya issue. A lot of Rohingyas have said, or you know, originally, basically, they belong to Bangladesh. That is a well accepted fact. They have been entering India to save their lives from Myanmar and the other countries. Bangladesh has not been able to resolve that matter so far. There is still an issue of cross-border terrorism and human trafficking. Please do remember as a fact, India's largest international land border is with Bangladesh only. 4096 km. Amongst all the neighboring countries, India's largest land border is with Bangladesh. That is why it's important for us to keep good relationship with Bangladesh intact despite all the external factors. Remember in Bangladesh politics, America also has been taking a keen interest in the past few months. America said that we will not be giving visas to ministers from Bangladesh government if they don't hold the elections in a transparent manner. They were forcing Bangladesh to make a caretaker government to hold the election, but they did not do that. India now has to play a key role in ensuring that Bangladesh does not see a lot of interference from America. Bangladesh's economy is dependent a lot on its clothing and merchandise industry. A lot of these companies are from the US. If they withdraw from Bangladesh, it will become a Bangladesh problem economically. So we don't want that also to happen in the long run. These are the articles from the mains exam point of view. From the Pillings point of view, the first article that we have here is an invention of a new AI chip. Kairali AI chip from Digital University, Kerala, first of its kind. Now, as you know, nations around the world, including India, have been running towards the chip technology. Chip, that is semiconductor chip, is an integral component of almost all the electronic products. The phone or the laptop from where you are watching me right now, the tab that you are watching me right now, has many, many, many chips. Most of the instruments that you use would have some kind of chip. Now, there is a lot of new chips that have entered the market. The most recent ones are the AI chip, that is artificial intelligence chip that have the ability to learn over time and make better decisions. One of those chips that has just been invented is the Kairali AI chip. Do remember that. This is Kerala's first silicon proven artificial intelligence chip. It has much better speed, power efficiency and scalability as well. And it has applications in different sectors. It can be used in agriculture for understanding crop health, soil conditions, etc. It also has the potential to ensure that the mobile industry gets much more efficient chips. Now, please understand, India has made a lot of progress in making our own mobile phones. India is now making a lot more mobile phones as compared to what we were. But one problem with that is, most of the mobile phones that we are still making in India, most of its components are still being imported from outside. So it's more of assembly in India rather than made in India. A most, the most important component of these mobile phones are these chips. So once these chips are being made in India, it will actually make sure that India's chances of truly making mobile phones in India would see the light of the day. This is the gist of the AI chips. Again, AI chips are different from the other semiconductor chips in the sense that they can turn data into information and gain knowledge by itself and become better in decision making. The companies that are usually the leaders in the chip industry are NVIDIA, IBM, etc. 
if you, I don't know if you read the news just the other day, I think yesterday only there was a news that Facebook or Meta as it's called has just placed an order to buy billions of dollars of chips from NVIDIA. So again, nations around the world, companies around the world want to get their hands on the latest semiconductor chips and AI chips and making this, inventing this in Kerala is a big step forward. This is a difference between AI chip and the general purpose hardware. AI chips give you much faster computation and they have much better bandwidth memory. That is, they are able to allocate much better space and this accounts for much better and much faster processing in the long run. Next article is about the Nisar project. It's a joint collaboration between NASA and ISRO. It has been in the news for some time. It was delayed for a few times, but now the announcement has come that it will launch soon. That is in first half of 2024 itself. We might see this mission seeing the light of the day. What exactly is this mission? So it's a low earth orbit observatory. It's an observatory which will keep an eye on the earth. The idea is it will use its radar to scan the Earth's land and ice cover regions twice every 12 days. Please do remember this piece of information is important. It will scan Earth's surface twice every 12 days. What will it do? It will help us to make better assumptions and make better predictions about the disasters that might hit certain parts of the Earth in the long run. Also, the important part and what sets this project apart from the other project that we usually see is that it is using double wavelength. So there's a long wavelength band that is being provided by NASA and there's a short wavelength band that is being provided by ISRO. So it's a joint project. The other information to remember here is it's a three year mission in total. It's not that it's a very long mission, it's just a three year mission as such. And the aim is to collect as much information as possible to the low earth orbit observatory by scanning the earth twice every 12 days to ensure that we can predict our weather and our climatic patterns much better, much more accurately in the future. Here are a few things that you must remember about the project. It's a collaboration between NASA and ISRO. It's a low earth orbit observatory. It will be launched from India, from Sri Harikota. The launch vehicle will be provided by ISRO only. ISRO's GSLV Mark II will be the launch vehicle. It will have a lot of data and it's considered as one of the most expensive projects so far in this field. It is estimated to have one and a half billion dollar cost. The lifespan will be three years. We will survey the land and the ice covered surfaces every 12 days. Do remember that part. The last article for today is about an interesting species that is called the mosquito fish. Now, why is it called the mosquito fish? Not because it looks like a mosquito, but it's called the mosquito fish because it has been used in the past to get rid of mosquito. How? So the idea is mosquito lay their eggs, that is lava, on water. So they basically float on the water body is a mosquito eggs. That is why it is said time and time again that you should not have stagnant water in your household. If you have stagnant water in your cooler, etc., you should change it. Water should not collect. That is because you don't want lava or mosquito eggs to propagate on that water. So what happened is many, many years ago, in fact, many decades ago, scientists found out that there are some fish that eat those eggs as food. So if we introduce these fish in water where there are mosquito eggs, these fish will be able to eat those eggs and the population of the mosquito will decline. This is where the name mosquito fish comes into the picture. That is, they help us to reduce the population of mosquito by feeding on the mosquito eggs. Now, it has been working well for many years, but now the problem is they are being considered as invasive in India. Now, what's an invasive species? Invasive species basically means when you introduce a species from outside for certain, uh, you expect certain result, but it impacts your food cycle by reducing the population of something else. For example, this species or this fish might eat some other fish, might consume some other nutrients. Now, because of those nutrients lowering in quantity, we might see the other fish having a problem. So it might disturb the entire cycle. These are called invasive species. Invasive species are those that are detrimental to that particular environment. This is what is the problem with this fish now. Now, in the last few months, Many governments in India in order to control the population of mosquito have introduced a mosquito fish such as 
Andhra Pradesh, Odisha, Punjab, in fact, lakhs of these fish have been introduced. Recently, in Vishakhapatnam, the government introduced 20 lakh of these fish. And now they'll introduce 6 lakh of these fish again. It's again not a new solution. It's an old solution being used in many parts of the world. In 1960s, they were being introduced in freshwater ecosystem to feed on mosquito larva. And since then, the process has continued. It started in the US, but now many countries use this. But the problem is now, since they feed on other nutrients as well, they are decreasing the value of nutrition in the water in many parts of the world. In India, these fish also have a history of being used since the time of the British. Again, mosquito fish is a common name which is used for multiple fish. One of those is Gambusia. It was in 1928 that the Gambusia fish was first introduced in India during the British rule. ICMR also supported this idea that yes, we should use it. But in the past few years, again, the people's perception about this fish has changed negative. For example, WHO in 1982 said that we should stop using this fish for mosquito control because it harms your local habitat. In 2018, National Biodiversity Authority of the Government of India also said that these are invasive alien species and they might harm your local environment. The government said that rather than using this fish, maybe we can ensure some other safeguard. Maybe we can ensure that there's no stagnant water. We can ensure that the water is running to ensure that the population of mosquito reduces. We should not use this fish going forward. This brings us to the end of today's discussion. Here are a couple of practice questions based on the topics that we had discussed today. Once again, reminding you, you can make sure that you practice these answers by student or by using the student answer writing portal where you will see answers of other students as well. You can give each other feedback, expect a feedback from the other students as well. The link for that portal is in the description of the video. Don't forget about the homework that I gave you. I asked you about the concept of pocket bill when it was or pocket veto rather when it was first used in India by which president, what was the bill all about Do tell me in the comment section. Thank you so much for joining. I'll see you tomorrow. 10 a.m. for the next session of the Hindu News of Analysis. Have a good day ahead. Bye-bye. Jain.